Now I have been carrying the Leatherman Arc for about four months as my primary multi-tool. Now I've carried other things, but this has been in my pocket the majority of the time. And at this point, I think it's time to make some conclusions, whether you should or should not buy this tool and for what reasons. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. We have a brand new Leatherman Arc, and I'm gonna tell you four reasons you might wanna consider it. And I'm also gonna tell you four reasons why you might want to skip buying this. Let's go ahead and get started. So when you open the package, you're gonna get three things, basically. You have a sheath here, which is sort of their new design with a couple of slots on the side. It's pretty big for the Leatherman Arc. You're also going to get a bit kit. Now notice there are nine bits here and there is not a micro bit. We'll talk about that later in this video. And then of course you have the Leatherman Arc. Now I got a brand new one for a couple of reasons. I have already done a number of modifications on my tool and I think there's no way to make a proper video unless we're talking about the original orientation. So I have a new one right here. We're also gonna take this opportunity to do some additional testing on a few failure points later in the video. Number one, and I think the most important consideration of why this tool is so hyped is the tool set itself. Beyond the blade, which we'll talk about in a little bit, the tool set on this with four outer implements that everyone has been asking for is fantastic. So we have a saw, a diamond file with a really aggressive cross cut on the other side, along with a serrated teeth down here for cutting uh, on soft metal. We have a scissor, we have a saw, and we have a straight blade. Not a partial serration, which no one likes, but a straight blade. That is already exactly what people have asking for in combination with the bit driver and the micro bit driver. These are things that people have wanted in the free platform for a really long time. So the biggest consideration, the biggest reason I think that this got so popular isn't just the blade, but rather the tool set itself. The choices that they have made on this tool set were really good. And it's what people have been wanting for probably two decades and never really got in any other platform. The free P4 kind of missed the mark a little bit. The Leatherman Wave never quite had it perfect. Well, for once we actually have all the tools we want where we get to keep the reamer and we also get the outside accessible larger pair of scissors. So that is the biggest reason I think that you should consider this tool in the first place. Second reason I think you might want to consider the Leatherman Arc being the only available free series plier-based multi-tool right now. Uh, for some reason, the P2 and the P4 are not being sold, and I'm not sure what that's all about. This is a one-handed platform, meaning that regardless of what hand you're using, you can deploy and access any of the inner or outer implements. Now, people have asked me, what about opening the blade left-handed? Well, you can do it without moving the blade, but here's the cool part. Because of the way this is designed and because the thumb stud is removable and you can screw it in the opposite side, you could take this blade out, swap it over to the saw location, and then you would in fact have a left-handed tool. And there's even a spot for the pocket clip if you wanna do that. Now, I'm not 100% sure what uh, Leatherman's policy is on it, but I think for a left-hander that is probably worth the change. But even without it, you definitely can access the blade one-handed. So that is a very nice thing. And everything else is equally easy for both left and right-handers. So that is a huge plus and definitely something you're gonna wanna consider when you're talking about the Leatherman Arc. Now, the third reason you probably wanna consider it is this, as of right now, with the P2 and the P4 not being available, this is the only Leatherman currently made that is technically USA made. Now, I know people are gonna be shocked by this, but if you look at something like the Leatherman Wave Plus, you'll notice that there is no USA written anywhere on the tool whatsoever. There's a reason for that. Although these are fully assembled in the United States, they are not technically meeting that 70% threshold that make them made in America. 
The only tools in recent memory that have been able to pass that threshold are the P2, the P4, and now the Leatherman Arc. So if this is something that is important to you, and it does cost a lot of money to move those components in-house, like the bit driver and the plier head, you might want to consider it for that reason. Because USA is a made, being able to say USA made is actually not as easy as you would think. And it's not only on the blade, but it's also on the pliers as well. So I got to commend Leatherman for this. This was a big thing that they talked about when the free series tools came out. And I think it's worth kind of patting them on the back. This is a, a big thing and it does cost them additional money in order to move things in house so that they can do it all themselves. So if you like that and you want something that has that USA stamp on it, this might be the tool for you. Last thing. And it's probably the big claim to fame. It's, it's what you're seeing in all the advertisements. It's what has the knife community all going crazy. It's the MagnaCut blade. Now this blade is far better than I initially expected. Um, I, when I talked about it and we first unboxed it, I was impressed that they actually had a sharpening choil and the grind was relatively even. And looking at this brand new one I just unboxed, this also looks like they have done a pretty good job on the grind, like way better than I've seen some other Leathermans come out of the box. And I've had quite a bit of experience using this as my primary knife blade, and I don't even carry a folding knife when I have this in my pocket. So I use this for everything, the food prep, and I use this for opening packages and just about everything else. And here is a cool thing. The coating I initially thought had no real purpose, right? Um, with a MagnaCut blade, which has incredible corrosion resistance, along with toughness and edge retention, you don't really need a coating, right? It's not going to get rusty, or at least not as fast as everything else in the tool. But what I have found is that this coating has made it very hard for sticky substances like tape glue to actually stick to the blade. And that has been actually really nice, and it's made it very easy to clean. So. I'm actually gonna give a huge thumbs up for the coating. I didn't initially think it was worth the added cost, but now after using it for a few months, I'm actually kind of thankful it's there. So definitely the MagnaCut blade. It's gonna have incredible edge retention in comparison to the S30V or 154CM that we have in other tools. And uh, if you ever wanna see it tested, Pete from Cedric Canada did his independent testing of this exact knife and blade and you can see the link to that down in the description. So I will find that video so you guys can watch it if that's something of interest. Now we're gonna to have to move on to the reasons why you might wanna skip it. We're gonna come right back around to the blade on the negatives here. And this is not something that everyone's going to care about, which is why I'm starting with this. MagnaCut is one of those incredible steels that has a wide range of hardness usability. So it can go from say 58 HRC all the way up to 65 and still be very usable with great properties. The thing is, and the knife community is very particular about this subject, this is probably done a lot softer than it should have been for this steel. According to the data, the inflection point where toughness and edge retention have the greatest combined total is somewhere between 62 and 63 HRC. Now that's based on the data. This, based on the testing of other people, is probably between 58 and 61 at best, okay? And that's pretty low for MagnaCut. So that, that is one thing you're gonna to wanna to be aware of. If you're a true knife snub, it's not gonna perform at the same level that uh, some of your other um, knife blades will. So it's just not gonna be quite the same. And that, that may bother you. So you just wanna be made aware of it. The other thing that we wanna talk about is actually the geometry of the blade itself. So this is actually incredibly thick at the edge. So I'm not, I don't have an exact caliper measurement, but just trust me when I say that this is incredibly thick behind the edge. That means that it's not going to slice things particularly well, and it's not going to have the kind of longevity when you're cutting abrasives that a thinner edge will. 
And MagnaCut does very well with thin edges. So it feels like a lost opportunity. And if you compare it to the 40th anniversary edition multi-tool that they had that was limited, which had a nice thin full flat grind, I really wish they had gone more that route versus the one they have here. So that is something you're definitely gonna wanna consider. For what I use it for, which is primarily utility tasks, I don't notice too much of an issue. And I've certainly been able to use it for food prep it's just not the sliciest knife blade that I've ever seen. And here is where we're gonna talk about the big one, the big problem that you're gonna to wanna to be made aware of. Now, this is not just the Leatherman Arc. I should very much clarify this. The cutter issue that we've talked about that so many people are talking about does not, is not limited to the Leatherman Arc. If you are buying a multi-tool past 2021, you probably already have a tool with these new less good cutters. And what are we talking about right now? We're talking about cutters that have this massive gap down at the bottom. Now, in comparison to the way they used to be, notice that there's almost no gap whatsoever on the ones on the right compared to the ones on the left. Now, this does a couple of things. It makes the hardwire cutters worse, but it also means that for some other materials, you're gonna get incomplete cuts. So in the case of something like a wire tie, if I go to cut it, what ends up happening is if I slide it all the way down and I close it, I get an incomplete cut. Now there's quite a bit of material that's still left to be cut. That is not to say that the Leatherman does a perfect job, okay? So even the original ones were not quite perfect. You can see this, there was a little bit of stuff left, but not as much. And uh, yeah, that is part of the problem. Now the other half of this now, this one's are tuned in a little bit better, it seems. The other half of this problem is something I discovered on camera, which is that the hardness, the, the heat treatment on these cutters was not done well, specifically in a batch of cutters for the Leatherman Arc. And on camera, again, what we are gonna do is bring in the infamous coat hanger. It's the same one that broke the cutters on this tool. And we're gonna attempt to see if we can recreate it. Now, I don't think this is going to fail like that one did, but I think we're gonna still have trouble with uh, cut cuts for sure. I think it's still gonna have issues with incomplete cuts. See, what happens is, is it gets caught in that hole and it doesn't quite want to finish. And that's part of the problem. And you can start to see, are we having any breakage? Maybe. We'll go a couple more times, see if we can recreate it. But you'll notice that we have issues where we're not fully cutting through the material. Now you could move it up a little bit, right? You can go up to the, the next height right there and you could probably cut it without any issue. But when I'm working with something, I'm not thinking like that. If I have hardware, I'm gonna slop it, slide it all the way down and I expect it to cut like I would with the free P4, which I will do so right here. No problem. Or the cutters that they sent me with as a replacement for the Leatherman Arc the first time around. That's what I expect. Now, I was happy to see that it didn't fail. So this is likely having new cutters that have not, that are properly heat treated, but they still have an issue by not cutting things very well. So they have made a downgrade on the cutters. And I wanna take this opportunity to correct something that I said in my last video where I did a follow-up. I assumed that because I was getting the past generation cutters, which do not have this flaw, that everyone who got a warranty replacement would also get these cutters versus the crappy ones. And I'm sorry to say that is not the case. In fact, I have communicated with a lot of people at this point who have all broken their cutters and every one of them said they have gotten a replacement that is in, in exactly the same as this cutter right here. And that is really quite unfortunate. It is also quite unfortunate that Leatherman has decided that you will not be able to get a warranty replacement for your cutters unless they are broken. So if they break them, if I had just broken the cutters right there, I would have been able to apply to Leatherman and get a brand new set of cutters. Now, I don't think they would be the nice ones, but I could get a replacement. 
So they only are working reactively. So I want to clarify that and just make it clear because I wasn't sure about this when we started, we made that, that follow-up video, but Leatherman will only send you a replacement if the cutters are broken. That's it. So that is number two on the list and is one of my biggest reasons for avoiding not just the Leatherman Arc, but any Leatherman tools made from 2021 forward that use the replaceable cutters. The next negative I wanna talk about is specifically the included bit kit. So you'll notice that first of all, we are missing one of the 10 slots on here, which is already an annoyance. But there's another thing that I realized not till much later after purchasing it, is that this is actually a combination of bits from one of the two bit kits and the other one as well. It doesn't include the precision bit, which would be a nice bonus to have as a backup because they do get lost, and we'll talk about that in a second. And it doesn't include the T6, T8 bit, which is one of the things that I use the most when it comes to the Leatherman bit kit because it allows me to adjust the pocket clip and many, many other things. Now, the other thing, I'm gonna go quickly and talk about one of the things that I didn't discover, but they did over at Dutch Bushcraft Knives. They actually were using this tail end as a hammer, and they found that when they did so, this little protector was not enough to keep the Leatherman bit from falling out. And the same thing was true with this precision bit as well. So, it's an unintended consequence of having the combination of a hammer as well, or a persuading end, and these loose components, but definitely something that really comes in on the negative side. You're very likely to lose those bits if you use the hammering section. That is not something that you'll ha that'll have happen when you're using the P free P4 because there's no loose parts. So between the lack of logic on this bit kit and the problem with the hammer, I definitely think this is something to keep in mind. If they had either picked set A or set B, it wouldn't have been the end of the world because then all you have to do is buy the other one and you have a complete set. But in order to have a complete set with this already, you have to buy the entire thing, which kind of makes it a little useless. That's just my opinion. It's like they put everything that they had spare in one thing and then didn't include a precision bit, which really doesn't make sense. At the very minimum, they should have included that and whatever would have been in this 10th slot. So with that in mind, consider the add-ons and what you would actually want with this tool. And if it were me, I would probably get the extender instead. I wish they had just included the extender because that would allow me to use Leatherman bits, quarter inch, as well as the Weeha double-sided bits. That would have made so much more sense and would have felt so much more justified in the price. So the thing that should really give you pause about buying a Leatherman Arc is gonna end up being the price. These are currently sitting at $230 pretty much anywhere, regardless of where you buy it. And as I stated in my first couple videos, even with that price, I had a feeling that this would still sell incredibly well. There are a lot of enticing reasons to purchase the Leatherman Arc, but the price is still quite high. And I think if you're, and, and this is where I'm going to state my grounding principle on multi-tools. If you're going to buy this and you're not going to carry it on your person, and I mean in your pocket or on a hol in a holster, every single day, you absolutely are overpaying for this multi-tool and pretty much every multi-tool because you're either better off buying an inexpensive one that's gonna cover most of your bases, or you may as well assemble a proper toolkit that you can keep in your backpack, a small one that's going to cover all your bases and probably have better independent tools than this will have. This is only worth it if you carry it every single day. Now I'm gonna circle back around to the price in a positive sense. Let's talk about how you can justify $230. First and foremost, the warranty. The 25 year warranty, it's not just a manufacturer's warranty. They actually replace and fix a lot more things than most companies would. And I probably value that warranty between 20 and 25% of the total price. That makes that 40 to $50 of the overall price tag. 
that drops this thing from 230 to 190. But what about the rest of it? If we're comparing it to the free P4, which is about $150, you have the MagnaCut blade, right? Over 420HC. That's probably between five and six times as expensive from just the raw cost of materials, but that's not where most of this is coming from. Being a vanadium steel, MagnaCut is going to cost a lot more to machine. It's gonna take a lot longer. It's gonna run through belts really quick. It's gonna have more maintenance and general requirement for machines and so on, more man hours. It's just gonna be more expensive in general to produce that. And it's actually substantially more than you might expect. Even though it's just one item switching out the blade, believe me when I say, when you go to a premium steels like that, a lot of it is the actual heat treatment and finishing of the blade itself. So I would probably account $30 to $40 of the price by itself being just the blade. And then there's also a few other things worth accounting for. Different tooling and also the in-house, likely in-house production of this bit driver that's going to increase the price between $5 and $10. The bit kit that's included with it, although it's not great and I don't like it, it's still probably a $5 to $10 value, probably more like a $5 value. The same thing is true with the micro driver. And uh, yeah, uh, that's. I think it all works out to be a reasonable jump up in price. But not everything that's included is something I'm willing to pay for. Like, for instance, a bit kit that doesn't quite, you know, set the stage as being ideal. And if I could lower the price at all by removing these items, I would wish they would. Because I think it would be more accessible to people. That's just my personal opinion. As it sits, I, I do carry this quite a bit. And I like it because it kind of works as a replacement for my dedicated knife. And I, I like the thumb stud. I actually didn't, I actually thought it was a joke initially because I thought, wow, Leatherman with a thumb stud, that's pretty unusual. Uh, it, it doesn't seem quite right. And this, the coating and that all threw me for a loop. But now that I have it, I really like it. I really do. Um, it's not for everyone though. Look, I'm one of those weirdos that since 1999, I've been carrying a Leatherman on my person I would say more than half of that time. That's unusual. And if you're not one of those people that carries a multi-tool on your person, that's a pretty expensive, it's a tall order to justify it, especially without the accessories that make it make sense. That's it. That's my conclusion with the Leatherman Arc. Be aware of the positives and the negatives and make a proper decision depending on those things. But of course, make sure that you are committed to the decision to carry it every day. Because if you're not going to do it, you're almost definitely going to be overpaying. As always, thank you for your time. And we'll talk again soon.